All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to No Final Bell. Um, this week's episode, we are going to be talking about uh, Impact's Rebellion as well as AEW Dynamite Rampage. Yes, no, ROH. Um, but as always, we are going to give it to Marty to start off, and then I'm going to um, take us in with AEW yeah. talk right afterwards. So, there were two matches on the countdown to Rebellion which happened a half hour before the main show. The two matches that we had were uh, two tag team matches. So one of which being, I guess you could say, kind of like a throwaway tag team match just to put both tag teams on the Rebellion card. Um, and it was, I didn't realize, first of all, I didn't realize that he underwent a name change. Um his name is now Champagne Singh, which he is formerly Raj Singh. Um, he and Shira took on Heath and Rhino, and they beat Heath and Rhino. And then after the match, they eat a glory from Rhino. So uh, there's that. Um, this next match, I'm kind of bummed in a way that they put this on the countdown, which is essentially their pre-show. I'm a little bummed that they put this on the countdown because um, of all the matches that you could have had. Well, I mean, of all the matches that you did have, I should say, um, you decided to put it on the countdown. I mean, I guess, you know, which we I will get into that, but I guess uh, Santino Morella's uh, return to wrestling was bigger and it needed to be, like, on the main show as opposed to, like, I mean, got to look at the bigger picture there, but even still. Um, so with that, the Knockouts Tag Team titles were on the line on the countdown as the coven of uh, Taylor Wilde and Kylan King took on Death Dolls, which at this point now, Death Dolls is Rosemary and Jessica as, you know, we all know what happened to Taya Valkyrie. Mm -hmm. um, but the Coven took on the Death Dolls for the Knockouts Tag Team titles, and the Coven retained. So um, it, it's kind of crazy, though, to think that, you know, Kylan King, a, a relative newcomer to Impact Wrestling and the Knockouts division, kind of gets, like, not really thrust into... Um, that position, but in a way, it's like they kind of thrust her into that position of like, oh hey, um, we're gonna pair you up with Taylor Wilde. You two are gonna win the Knockouts Tag Team Titles. Like, what a hell of a way to debut Kylan King and Impact. But uh, so that's the countdown. Then we get on to the main show, and what a way to start off the main show. Then. I don't have this written down, but this was Ultimate X. What a better way to open Rebellion than with Ultimate X for the Impact Tag Team titles. Bullet Club taking on the Motor City Machine Guns. And, uh, well, it's interesting because the way that commentary was describing them, they called them ABC. So, I don't know if that's their new tag team name in Impact Wrestling. Um, but, at the same time, I look at it as, like, they're still technically part of Bullet Club. So, I'm still going to call them Bullet Club at the end of the day. I mean, because we technically have two Bullet Clubs with Bullet Club Gold. And then, you know, regular Bullet Club. So, but, um, it was a very back and forth match. It had a lot of, uh, well, I say it had a lot of, but there really wasn't a lot of, uh, like high spots in the match for Ultimate X. Um, but either way, Bullet Club did beat the Motor City Machine Guns to retain. And, uh, so I had mentioned this earlier. Santino Morella returning to the ring on a major pay-per-view in nine years 
His last televised wrestling match was nine years ago in WWE. And uh, he teamed up with Joe Hendry and Dirty Dango to take on the design. Four on three. I thought it was going to be a six-man tag, but it was actually all four members of the design. It was Diener, Angels, Khan, and Callahan. Um, and speaking of Callahan, ladies and gentlemen, the Death Machine is back. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Callahan turned on Diener and the design, costing the design the match against Santino, Joe Hendry, and Dirty Dango. This next match, um, the main thing that stood out from this match is the fact that PCO ended up dislocating his shoulder in the match, and at one point, he went over to the turnbuckle and started ramming his shoulder into it to pop it back in place. I tell you, folks, they're not kidding. He is not human. PCO is an absolute beast. And he's like 57, 58 years old. Like, the man is nuts. But, um, either way, it was a last rights match, which essentially is a, another way of saying a casket match. Um, because they had the, excuse me, they had the casket out there. And, like, they were brawling in the ring, outside of the ring, around the casket, and everything like that. Um, so, but in the end, PCO got the win over Eddie Edwards, choke slammed him into the casket, and closed the lid on him to win that last rights match. Then we had a triple threat elimination match for the X Division title between Trey Miguel, Speedball Mike Bailey, and Jonathan Gresham. Speedball Mike Bailey was the first... No, actually, I think it was Jonathan Gresham that was the first to get eliminated. Um, either way, Trey Miguel was able to retain. He eliminated both Speedball and Jonathan Gresham to retain. We then had Hardcore War between Team Dreamer and Team Boy. Um, the five, or yeah, the five men for Team Dreamer obviously included Tommy Dreamer, uh, Frankie Kazarian, Yuya Uemura, Upender Gujar, and um, Killer Kelly. And then on Team Bully, you had Bully Ray, Masha Slamovich, Brian Myers, Kenny King, and Moose. So, but during the match, the good hands did get involved, um, but it didn't make much of a difference because... Like I said, Team Dreamer was able to beat Team Bully. There was one... I didn't get that. Could you try it again? There was one funny part in the match. Sorry about Siri. But, um... There was one funny part in the match where, uh... Bully Ray had gone up to climb a ladder with Tommy Dreamer suspended on a table. He asked the referees to come in and hold the ladder for him. The referee just looked at him and like, no. And then he gets down, he's like, I told you to hold the, hold the ladder open. For Meanwhile, all four referees that were in the ring all end up beaten down on Bully Ray. They've had enough of his crap. And Tommy Dreamer hits a Dreamer driver on him. Um... But either way, that's that. Team Dreamer was able to beat Team Bully in Hardcore War. And by the way, Hardcore War, to 
sum it up lightly is just war games without a cage. I mean, that's really the best way to describe it. Um, same thing with NWA had what they called Team War, which was essentially the same rules. Just I don't remember if it was no disqualification or not. Um, but I do remember that like it was similar stipulation. I believe it was pinfall or submission. Uh, the first one to achieve it out of whatever team would be the victor. And I'm I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, how many other places have like a war games or you know war style match? But uh, either way, we get on to the second to last match of the night. Now. For Rebellion, we were guaranteed new Impact World Champion for the men's and a new knockout a new knockout world champion for the women. So the first of two title matches for a vacant world title took place between Steve Macklin and Kushida. And uh well First of all, before I get into that, I do need to mention that there was uh, somebody special who was a guest commentator, and he is new. He is newly signed to Impact Wrestling, but I guess you could say returning to Impact Wrestling. Uh, Nick Aldis. Nick Aldis is. Back in Impact Wrestling, he has signed a multi-year deal, I believe he said. And uh, he's eyeing the world champion, whoever it ended up being. So, but, uh, which the new world champion ended up being Steve Macklin. Steve Macklin beats Kushida to become the new Impact world champion. And after the match, attacks Scott Demore when presenting the title to him which captures the attention of the newly signed Impact Wrestling Nick Aldis. So, Nick Aldis had championship aspirations since the beginning, basically. Like, ever since he came out there, he was like, hey, I've got my eyes on that prize. And, I mean, hey, when you're a former two-time NWA World Heavyweight Champion, how could you not have world title aspirations? In another company. Um, so then we get on to the main event. Which was the second of. Which was the second of the two. World title matches. Where we are guaranteed a new champion. It was Deanna Perrazzo versus Jordan Grace. And Deanna Perrazzo had earned her opportunity. By competing in a fatal four way match at the inaugural uh, Multiverse United show back in March. Or no, I'm sorry, during back in earlier this month uh, during WrestleMania weekend in Los Angeles. And um, the implications at the time were that whoever wins the match would then face Jordan Grace and Mickey James, if Mickey James is able to compete. But obviously, she was not able to compete. She did, she had to vacate the world championship, and uh, that is how we are we have were led into this match at Rebellion against Jordan Grace. Um, needless to say, they had a very back and forth contest, but ultimately. It led to Deanna Perrazzo once again becoming the knockout world champion, three-time knockout world champion, Deanna Perrazzo. And it's the first time in quite a while that we've had a couple in wrestling hold both the Impact World title and the Knockout World title at the same time. 
I believe the last couple to do so was uh, Johnny Impact and Taya Valkyrie. I believe that was the last couple in wrestling that did that. So that is it for Impact Rebellion. Now we'll get on to Dynamite. Yeah, so... um... There is a lot to talk about with this first segment. Yeah, there is. Um, It it went over... A long it was like time. 15 minutes. Yeah, so uh, of a segment. Jungle Boy comes out to the ring and say a few words, but gets interrupted by Sammy Guevara, who says a few words before getting interrupted by Sammy the, by Darby Allen, uh, who says to Sammy he likes him the most out of all the pillars, and says he's least qualified to challenge for the AEW World Title since people view him as a follower, not a champion, and says that the difference between Darby and Sting. And Sammy and Chris Jericho as Darby and Sting view each other as equals. Um, that he became TNT champion on his own. And to become world champion, he'll have to do it on his own since Chris Jericho is holding Sammy back. Uh, it says if he and Chris have a problem with it, they come talk to Sting and Darby. Uh, then addresses J- Jungle Boy and says he was handpicked and the least desiring person to challenge and admits he was jealous since he was still living in his car wandering uh wondering if he if he'd ever make it to AEW and says nothing about Jungle Boy intimidates him uh Jungle Boy then um retorts back. retorts back by saying he sees a bunch of kids wearing the face paint of Darby Allen, wondering if they knew what he's really like Antisocial, unfriendly, and rude to anyone, uncool, and says he's only an AEW because he couldn't make it as a skateboarder. He then addresses Sammy Guevara, who says he'd love to come up with a new way to describe how much of a dirtbag he is, but says he respects Sammy the most of, out of him. Out of him, Darby. Him, Darby, and MGF. Uh, Sammy says Jungle Boy is just like MGF despite how much he hates him and says both Jungle Boy and Darby Allen were handpicked to be here. Uh, thanks Darby Allen for giving him hope in AEW and says it's time for Darby to sit back and watch him become world champion. Uh, Jungle Boy says spoiler alert it'll be him that wins and he'll do it for every single person that has supported him since day one. Out comes MGF to announce the pillars tournament and the winner faces MGF at double or nothing for the AEW world Ch- title. Uh, Darby Allen gets a first round bye. Meanwhile, Sammy will face Jungle Boy and then whoever wins faces it off against Darby next week. Um, of and course, we'll talk week, about tonight. Well, later tonight, uh, it will be, you know, between, you know, whoever against, you know, Whoever won between Sammy and Jungle, Jungle Boy. Boy and will face off against Darby Allen later tonight in uh, Sunrise, Florida, which is uh, in the Fort Lauderdale area. So we will talk about that further on. As we get into our first match, it is Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter facing off against Ruby Soho and Tony Storm. We know the kind of beef that they that these um, these two teams have been having. Um, Soraya has kind of been in the in the forefront, in the background, but um, honestly, this was you know all right. You know, Ruby Soho and Tony Storm were doing as much as they could to really beat down Britt Baker and Jamie Hader, but Britt Baker and Jamie Hader, you there's no beating Britt Baker in Britsburg at all. No. Yeah, um, she was bringing it, so was Jamie Hader, and ultimately it led to Britt Baker tapping out um, Ruby Soho. I'm pretty sure. Yes, she tapped her out with the lockjaw. So, yes, Bray Baker and Jamie Hayter beat Ruby Soho and Tony Storm in the first match. Uh, and then the past couple of weeks have been tough because of everything that happened to the Elite. Uh, Kenny is having trouble sleeping at night. And the thing he regrets was not taking the, that screwdriver out of the turnbuckle to John Moxley's head. Uh, and, and wants to squash the beef with BCC. And then Danielson talks while the BCC attack the elite from behind and then um they attack each other and Danielson calls the elite amateurs as Don Callis during the time comes out to use a chair but 
looks like BCC is, you know, look at, it, it was ready, and then he runs away like a little coward. Well, well no, actually, I'm going to cut you off there and say that he was smart in that because of what happened the last time that he tried to, I mean, well, no, actually, last time, Don Callis didn't even attempt to, like, he was just there, he was saying his stuff, and then Blackpool Combat Club inflicted violence on him, and it ended mm-hmm. up causing him to bleed hard way, right. because of how he landed on the concrete, I think. We'll talk about another man that bled hard way, but in a different location. Um, but, uh, then Danielson pulls out the screwdriver, and then out comes... Uh, to catch the yes. even score, uh, could we see an eight-man tag match at double or nothing? I think that's the route. I'm pretty sure that's what the route is going to be going on. I mean, if, if we're going by what's going to take place tonight on Dynamite, it's the team of Omega and Takeshita versus the Butcher and the Blade. So, um, I mm. mean... To kind of get that chemistry down. Yeah. But honestly, I really do think that Kenny and... Well, and then, you know, during that match, you never know what could happen. I think Blackpool Comic Club could interfere. Honestly, I'm all for eight-man tag team match heading into um, the Elite versus the Blackpool Combat Club. I'm all for it. I mean, why not? You know, I think that maybe, oh, you know... Um, Hangman should be with the Elite, not Takeshita, but hey, that's just me. Um, I think Takeshita is a good fill-in for... You know what would be cool? Why doesn't Hangman Page join up with Juice Robinson and Jay White and join Black Bull Gold? You know what I could see for Forbidden Door, now that I think about it? What if it (laughs) is Elite versus Bullet Club? What if Hangman joins up with Bullet Club Gold to take on the Elite. That would be something. Uh, it they, doesn't make sense in the grander scheme of things. I think they're really teasing Bullet Club Gold versus Bullet Club. Like, there's definitely going to be a Bullet Club Civil War at Forbidden Door. But if there's anything, honestly, with this, I, I do see it being a man tag team match between the Elite and BCC at a uh, double or nothing. I think it would be a great match. Um, the build for it has been great. Um, why not pull the, the pull the trigger and, and make it happen? Um, this one, I'm not really gonna go about the match per se. I mean, it was all right. You know, Warlow mm. doing what needs to be done, and like these, these two men aren't. A lot of offensive-oriented kind of yeah. wrestlers whatsoever at all. So I'm gonna say, uh, congratulations to Warlow. He yeah. became a three-time TNT but champion. Here's my thing. But the difference is on this is that he has Art Anderson on his side. So maybe but this can make things a little bit different for him. I'm Hopefully. hoping so. But either way, like I'm looking at it as like, what do you think adding? Arn Anderson as a manager is going to do for Wardlow's TNT title reign. I mean, it's going to give him somebody that can talk the talk as he fights the fight. Yeah, I mean, because I was looking at it and I'm like, no disrespect to Wardlow, but he's just not really that great of a talker. And if you have somebody like Arn Anderson to do his talking for him. Like, that'll actually help him mm-hmm. in the long run. But at the same time, like I said, like, you know, at, like, let's look at the bigger picture here. Stop hot potatoing the TNT title, man. I agree. But he, he, here's like, why. Here, here's where I think that, you know, even if you do have him as a short reign for a third, I'm okay with it. Because it seems like there's a new challenger for the TNT Championship. And I guess I'm all for it. Because honestly, you know, Luchasaurus has been a big name. If you can build him up as a great singles guy, I think he can work as a TNT champion. A very dominant TNT champion, mind you. Um, And I'm hoping that's what 
is the plan for Luchasaurus. Because if it is, there, boom. You got something for Luchasaurus. Yeah. He can be a dominant TNT champion. Why can't you make him like what Orange Cassidy is with the International Championship? A very dominant champion. Yeah, I mean... Because, you know, already the International Championship outweighs the TNT yes. Championship right now. Yeah. Because Orange Cassidy is just that much better as a singles competitor now. Well, not to mention, Orange Cassidy has taken that title to other promotions right. and defended it. Like, I mean, literally, um, on the same day as Rebellion, Orange Cassidy was in Philadelphia mm -hmm. representing, or, yeah, representing New Japan Pro Wrestling defending the AEW International Championship against Gabriel Kidd. So, right. like, you know, and I know that when it was still, cons when it was still called the All-Atlantic title, Pac was defending that title in Rev Pro. I was going to say, if there's anybody that we, were, you know, we want to know where the hell has Pac been, yeah. where the hell has Pac been ever since losing the trio's tag team titles, because, you know... I mean, I would assume he's not hurt. He's just, you know. Well, actually, I don't know about that because he was wearing that mask for his broken nose. So maybe he's getting, like, reconstructive surgery or something to, mm, to heal his broken nose. I don't, like, I don't know. But about, honestly, but either way, I, I really mean, of course, we're going to hear. From I think Christian Cage and Luchasaurus later yeah. tonight. Um, I'm hoping that it's going to lead into a double or nothing match for the TNT Championship. Um, because if that, if that's the case, fine. I mean, I would be totally fine with Wardlow and Luchasaurus. I think it would be a decent match. Um, even though both men, I don't think no one can can wrestle at all. But hey, that's just me. Um. So, we're going to get on to the next match. Uh, Jay White and Cole Mandare. Um, oh, yeah. I, I tell you what. Cole Mandare. I mean, for the um, most part, it was a good match, except for one. Except for the one, uh, yeah. one spot he did in the match. But, honestly, it, this the way that he runs those ropes and everything like that. Oh, and, the, well, you're talking about the way he runs the ropes. What about the way he walks the ropes? Yeah, the like walks the ropes. Rope. It, it's just crazy what he can do on the, on the ropes itself. Um, you know, you thought maybe he had a had a chance in hell to be actually beating the Switchblade Jay White, but you know Jay White gets that Blade Runner and you're done one two three. That is top move as Jay White uh wins his debut match in AEW against Coman there, um, and then Sean Spears. Oh well, actually it was Juice Robinson did not take kindly. To Sean Spears giving it a five to Jay White. Yeah. As he throws him over and then he starts getting beaten down. But then the revolution yeah. is televised. <laughs> Ricky Starks comes in and makes a save for Sean Spears. What does this mean? Uh what it means is looks like uh Bullet Club Gold have found new competitor new opponents. <laughs> Don't mind the, me doing this few, Teddy Long, but I smell a tag team match, player. Uh, it, it seems like maybe Jay White and Juice Robinson are going to actually be on Double or Nothing card after all. Maybe Ricky Starks and Sean Spears will face off against Bullet Club Gold as their first real test in AEW. Um, Potentially. So, all for it, but I just think that maybe... Sorry, everybody. Um, I need to play a little pause a little as dehydrated as we got um, some beverages. But um, yeah, honestly, it, it seems like a weird pairing for Ricky Starks and Sean Spears. I get it a it, little bit. Tony Khan is like kind of running out of ideas of what to do for both men. So why not pair them together? Fine, <clears throat> I guess it's all right. But the agenda just proves that Ricky Starks can't do things on his own. Same thing yeah, with Sean Spears. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, to be fair, and no disrespect to Sean Spears, but could he really ever do anything on his own? I mean, he can if he was booked, you know. Yeah, that's true, I guess. The right way, I mean. I mean, he kind of um, revolutionized himself ever since, you know, leaving WWE and becoming a little bit of a bigger name in AEW, but um, it would be nice if he could actually maybe win a championship or something like that, which is his goal. Well, and goal in AEW. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I ended up seeing an interview that he did with Chris Van Vliet. He's like, you know, I don't want, my legacy is not going to be defined by championships or anything. It's going to be defined by the fact that I was somebody that like put in the time, put in the work. I lived, I loved, I, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So, <clears throat> he basically said that his legacy is not going to be defined by the amount of championships he did or did not win. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so, we on to the next segment as um, Adam Cole has studied and was inspired <laughs> by Chris Jericho. I mean, after all, his uh, Adam Cole baby chant was is literally, you know, he said it a lot in the interviews with people. His Adam Cole bebe comes from Chris Jericho, like, doing the whole put his foot on somebody and does come on, bebe! So. Um. And someday he wants to be uh, just like Chris Jericho and says it's pretty damn cool there in the, in the ring together for the first time ever. Um. And a ton of respect for him to shake and shake hands. Uh, Chris has zero respect for Adam Cole and calls him an arrogant son of a bitch. Um, Typical heel Jericho. Says it's unacceptable to shake Keith Lee's hand. Says lately that Chris has been a jack, jag off. And Adam Cole wants to know who the real Chris Jericho is. And Adam Cole thinks Chris Jericho is a stupid idiot. And Adam Cole doesn't want to play games anymore and wants to know now what? Chris isn't impressed with Adam Cole and says Adam doesn't want anything to do with him. And Chris wants Cole to leave the ring. And then they beat each other down. And out comes Daniel Garcia to help out. Uh, beating you know Adam Cole down. And then Britt Baker comes to save her man and slaps Chris Jericho. And then <clears throat> out comes the outcast to beat down Britt Baker. And then they handcuff Adam Cole and the rope. beat him down. And give the kendo stick to Soraya to beat Britt Baker down. And then the crowd chant piece of shit to Chris Jericho as Adam Cole had to watch this all happen. Yeah. And uh, the one... And also, uh, a little side note, later tonight at, we will hear from Adam Cole um, regarding everything that <clears throat> transpired yeah. uh, last week. And um, the one thing to point out that I picked up on during this segment as it was happening is the fact that when Britt was calling out to Adam Cole, she called him by his shoot name. So, <clears throat> and, and, you know, basically uh, Adam Cole was just like watching on and the whole thing. And yeah, like I'm not gonna share uh, Adam Cole's shoot name as it's you know not our place to do that. But uh, you can like if you see clips or ev- anything like on YouTube of what happened, you can pick up on it if you know what Adam Cole's shoot name is, like we do. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but. Ultimately, I, I don't think it's going to be a mixed tag team match like you say it's going to be. Because I still think that Outcast <clears throat> with uh, Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker are going to happen. I think like some kind of triple uh, tag team match of, of that sort is going to happen at Double or Nothing. I think we're going to get Adam well, Cole versus Chris <clears throat> Jericho. I think that's going to happen. That's, Stand that, alone. That's a given at this point. Mm-hmm. But... um. See, for me, I feel a little weird not having the world champion 
of the whip, like not having the women's world title be defended if that's the route that they end up going. Uh, because I if mean, you ask me, like, you know, regardless of if it's the men's or women's title, it should, it's a world title. I agree. It should be defended. I agree. And it probably should be. You know, maybe you could have one of the outcasts going up against Jamie Hayter, but the problem is, is that's <clears> not how they've been pursuing it as. That's true. And even then, um, we've been discussing it outside of the show it doesn't make a lot of sense to have the the member of the outcast taking a pinfall is Ruby Soho or even um like Tony Storm because you've already been down that road um with both of them and you've also um, been down that road in terms of like you you don't want them to take another pinfall loss especially Ruby Soho for the world title because then it basically makes people think that like oh Ruby Soho she's been handed many opportunities or not handed but she's been given many opportunities to challenge for a title in AEW, and she hasn't won. So you don't want to give that to... And then the whole... And then there's the whole thing with Soraya, and it's like, well, she's still early into her AEW career. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have her lose a match, especially of this caliber, for the women's world title. Right. You don't want to have her suffer her first... Well, not to mention, you also don't want to have her suffer her first loss this early. So, you know, it's a tough situation for Soraya if she was to be the challenger to Jamie Hayter. So I think a safe a safe bet to have is, like you mentioned, a tag team match consisting of Jamie and Britt versus two members of the Outcast. Yeah, I mean... But ultimately, I look at it this Like, I look at it this way. Ultimately, it will suck to not have the Women's World Champion defending her title at the pay-per-view. I'm pretty sure but it might it's be... It's not the first time that that's happened. Well, I'm pretty sure it's going to actually be the difference. I think it's... Um, I really do think that Maybe the title will actually be defended. We might get shocked that it actually will be defended and not be a tag team match after all. But the problem is, is that um, who, who of okay now if it is just a singles match, who of the outcasts would make the most sense? I know you were just you know talking yeah. about it. Um, who of the outcasts would make the most sense to go at up this against point, Jamie I would Hayter? Say, at this point, I would think Tony Storm. Because yeah, well, we already seen that Ben like, there done yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I get it, but honestly, it would make the most sense for to have her take a take a loss because she won't really, you know, it won't hurt her as much as say Ruby Soho mm. to lose a match of that caliber, right? Because you know, she, Tony Storm has been an AEW world, uh, Women's World Champion. So she's been in that uh, situation, and not to mention she lost to Jamie Hayter for that title anyway. Right. So, of course. Like, you know, it's basically the whole... Uh, it, it's basically the whole chasing the championship story all over again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the payoff being that, oh, she didn't... Uh, she didn't get it. So, right. It won't hurt her as much as, say, Ruby So Yeah, it probably wouldn't. Um, so we're going to get on to our next match. Um, actually, the, the main event <laughs> of Dynamite. Uh, we had Sammy Guevara facing off against Jungle Boy you Jack Perry. You, you missed the Oh, one. never mind. I'm, I'm sorry. The, before that, uh, we had Daddy, uh, Daddy S, Billy Gunn, and the Acclaim facing off against the Jericho Appreciation Societies. Uh, Matt Menard, Angelo Parker, and Jake Hager, as he likes this hat. Um, yes. 
He really does like that or- that but purple. The, the, let's not also forget that uh, Cool Hand Angelo Parker loves his hair days, man. He's always having a great hair day. Well, it actually got br- snapped yeah. by Daddy, Daddy S. S. Daddy S broke that comb in half. Yes, he did. Um, and then we had the uh, uh, Scissor Me Timbers, and then yeah. we also had um, I think that I think Daddy Ass Belly Gun actually was using the famous as, as well. In I think this he match. attempted it. I don't know if he actually was able to hit it. I know he was attempting it multiple but times. But all together, yeah, yeah, Daddy Ass Billy Gun and the Acclaim actually get the the victory over the Jericho Appreciation Society and all the power. Now to we them. get to the main um, event. yes, we get on to the main event. Uh, Sammy Guevara facing off against Jungle Boy Jack Perry. Um, we know it. You know, MGF saying, oh, Sammy's my friend. You know, Sammy, I've liked ever since. Well, yeah, apparently he came up t- uh, to Sammy Guevara's um, interview. Um, interview and also in the match got involved as we got our first uh, countout victory. As Sammy Guevara can beats Jungle Boy Jack Perry by countout with the help of MGF. Um, Jungle Boy was trying to get into the ring to beat the 10 count, but MGF pulled him back out and... So, well, it's interesting now that I think about it, because, like, um, Bryce Remsburg was distracted, and it caused MGF to be, to hit Jungle Boy. But, see, the thing is, with how long Bryce Remsburg had been distracted... Like, they, what they should have done is restarted the count. Because, you know, it didn't make a lot of sense to just keep the count going from 8 after that is that is. Well, epic. if you think like, about it, if well, you no, think about well, it, a well, count-out victory protects Jungle Boy Jack Perry in that sense. Well, okay, yeah, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just lose, talking about... Because he didn't lose clean. Yeah, no, I get that, but I'm just talking about, like, the whole... And here, I think, in a sense like this, and I hate to cut you off, um, I think in a sense like this, this is where, you know, you can have... I think you need to do the same thing with, it, you know, Darby or Sammy. I don't think you should have the loser win clean. Or lose clean. I agree. But, um, so what and then you can have to... And then I feel like you're going to have a segment of, like, oh, well... You never truly beat us. Yeah. MGF. Like, why do I think it's going to be Sammy that's going to win here uh, over Darby Allen? I think I could see it, it happening. I mean, after Only because all, the whole thing was that I think MGF, MGF paid off uh, Sammy to be able to get his, like, one on one. And then I can see it leaning into a fatal four way still at double or nothing, even mm-hmm. with them losing in this whole tournament. But then people are like, well, why would they have the tournament? Why did they have the tournament in, in the, the first, first place? place? Yeah. And but, it, um, because I feel like, you know, Tony Khan can come out and be like, well, because of, you know, MGF getting involved, we're still, you know, we're going to make it fair to everybody and we're going to have a fatal foray for the world title. And then MJF is like, then I'm watching MJF be like, well, that's not what we agreed to. You know, and yeah. I don't know. I, but, I just think um, that, you know, it's going to be something gonna get, like... So, getting back to that, like, what I was going to say about the count-out thing is, like, not that I think, uh, not that I'm saying that, like, not that I'm trying to shed light on, like, what WWE would do as opposed to, like, but at the same time, I look at it as, like, if it was WWE, they would have restarted the count after the distraction, and they still would have had, uh, and they still would have had it be that like Jungle Boy was knocked out long enough to uh, not be able to answer the count of ten. Mm-hmm. So, which logically would have made more sense than just continuing the count after he had been distracted by Sammy Guevara, like. You know, right. as a wrestling historian, uh, uh, you know, I like to consider myself mostly a wrestling historian. That finish, logically, in my mind, didn't make a lot of sense. 
Oh, yeah, so, probably didn't. You know, because, like, I mean, okay, in that sense, logically it made sense that, like, oh, they want to have it as a count-out uh, victory for Sam and Guevara. Right. But I'm talking logically in the terms of, like, okay, you had the referee distracted to be able to have MJF come in and hit Jungle Boy, but after the distraction, you should have restarted the count. Because, like, initially when I was seeing that, I'm like, wait, why did he do it from... Why did he count to, count nine and then immediately count ten? I was like, that like that didn't make a lot of sense. Mm, so, right. but It's just, like, a little thing that I could find to complain. I mean, but... Other than that, I really had no problem with the finish. Right, and then we get onto the rampage side of things as John Moxley faces off against uh, Christopher Daniels and, and beats him with the bulldog choke, immediately tapping out. Um, and then they shed a light on um, what happened to Christopher Daniels as apparently it's ruptured um, blood vessels in his eye that he's still dealing with today. Because he was like, oh, well... Blackpool Combat Club have had their problems with the Elite and and, uh, and the Young Bucks. And speaking of the Young Bucks, um, you know, they're the, the ones that, um, you know, gave uh, Christopher Daniels yeah, they the super eye. Yeah, kicked him first into place. the, they, they super kicked Daniels' face into the turnbuckle, which caused his eye to be like all, you know, well, it's interesting, too, because I thought it was only, like, his brow or whatever that got the brunt of it. But no, it was a complete, it was a hemorrhage in his eye that ended up, uh, like they mentioned on commentary, rupturing blood vessels. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, yeah, John Moxley does beat Christopher Daniels. And then, um, Jake But Card- interestingly enough, before we get on to no, that... Pardon. Interestingly enough, he can still see out of that eye, yeah. as he had an interview not too long ago with Chris Van Vliet, and Chris Van Vliet mentioned, like, hey, how's the eye doing? And Christopher Daniels said, I mean, I see the eye doctor almost daily, and he said there's still vision there, so, like, that's definitely a positive, hmm. but, it's yeah. crazy. Um, yeah, so... Later tonight, we're going to get uh, the TBS championship match finally between Jake Hargill and Jay, Tyler Valkyrie. But, but she cannot use her finishing move. Yes. Thoughts? Well, yeah. So, Taya cannot use the road to Valhalla. But I'm still pretty still sure... Away. I'm pretty sure it's, it's not the same. What better way to have her use a move... By somehow the ref being distracted. I was gonna say that like they can't have that stipulation without the referee like uh, taking a bump or whatever, and then uh, Taya hits the road to Valhalla on Jade, and then the referee like eventually comes to and potentially wins the match. I I, I, I I'm gonna have to go with Taya over here. I I think it's. The best time to have her win the TBS championship. I know I it sucks that it's not at the pay per view, but honestly, what better way to have her defeat Jay Cargill here? Um, I think it's just about time. I mean, nothing against Jay Cargill, but like, you haven't given her really credible opponents I, for well, that TBS championship. I hate to say well, it. Well, I mean, they did, but the fact that like they've kept Jade as the T as the TBS champion after all this time like I hate to make that comparison again but in a way it kind of feels like uh, AEW and Tony Khan is booking Jade Cargo much like WWE is currently booking Roman Reigns maybe because like they've given Jade Cargo, credible opponent after credit. Well, maybe not so much lately, but you know, Jade Cargo has had some very credible competitors for the TBS Championship, and then they just didn't give that opponent the the TBS title. And I'm looking at it, and I'm right. like, but 
but why? Most noteworthy one that I can think of off the top of my head, Athena. Well, I mean, she's running rampant. I would just say, obviously, she's, now, obviously she's doing somewhat better. She's pretty much running the Ring of Honor women's division now. So it's not entirely like a, a demotion of sort or whatever you want to call it for her right. being the Ring of Honor women's world champion. But at the same time, it's like. When you had the opportunity to give Athena the TBS title, you should have gave it to her. I agree. Um, we're going to get on to our next little segment. As uh, Jeff Hardy wants to finish his career in AEW on a high note and on uh, a depressing low. And then, uh, Which, good for Jeff Hardy, man. And Stokely Hathaway wants to know when the match will be. And then the firm beat down the Hardy party. Um... When will we get to smash? Uh, At double or nothing. I was gonna say double or nothing. That's when they're gonna get the 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 firm deletion. Yes. Um. As it seems like it's gonna be a eight man tag team match, unless Hook is not gonna no, be involved. No, 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 no. Actually, see, I think it's gonna be six man. I think Hook see, is not gonna be involved. Thing. No. See, here's the thing. It's the firm deletion, and they've said that it's going to be in the Hardy compound. Which I mean. That's where all of the other deletion matches have happened. So, and I think you're gonna finally see the Broken Hardys come out in this match. I think you're gonna see Matt and Jeff, which turn back the clocks and yeah. bring back the Broken Hardys. And honestly, because I feel like it's I much think they needed. should be I think they should be thrown into the Lake of Reincarnation and come out as Brother Nero and and Broken Matt. That would be cool. That would be cool, that and would that would be... be very nice, because we haven't really had a true, proper run of Broken Matt Hardy in AEW. Like, that just... That's the way I feel about it. Like, mm. I don't think we've had... Because, I mean, when Matt Hardy debuted in AEW during the pandemic, he was technically Broken Matt Hardy, but, like... The thing about the Broken Matt Hardy character is it just works so much better with a live crowd. And when we didn't have that in 2020, it kind of diminished his character as Broken Matt Hardy. Mm, yeah. Then he reverted back to Big Money Matt Hardy. And then eventually, you know, we started getting like... You, it, it was the period of time where it's like, oh, he's cycling through all of his gimmicks. Because, I mean, the, what was it? Uh, yeah, the Stadium Stampede 2020. He was basically, like, recycling all of his other gimmicks. I mean, you saw Version 1 Matt Hardy. You saw uh, Big Money Matt. You saw Broken Matt as he started in the match. And you saw Hardy Boys uh, Matt Hardy. Right. Like, and it was during that time where it's like, okay, you kind of have to, like, Matt Hardy needs to figure out, like, okay, what gimmick will work best for me at this current time? So, he just went, like, his entire career thus far in AEW has been him trying to find himself. And I think now the, the right time is for him to be broken Matt Hardy. That's right. just my opinion. Uh, so, yeah, Dustin Rhodes and Keith Lee are going to will be teaming up. Um, I don't know it's who again. It's kind of a weird pairing, if you ask it, me. It is. I mean. But so I'm willing to let it play out. I'm willing to let it play out. I, I think it's going to probably be against the Mogul Embassy in some way, shape, or form. Probably will be. Um. So, yeah, there's not really much about this, this match as... It was kind of lackluster. Uh, Julie Hart beats Kira Hogan. And then J- Anna JAS uh, comes down and beats down. Uh, well, they beat each other down after the match and have to get yeah. separated by wrestling security. Beth, um, hey, man, I don't know. It's all right because I, I think I hear a um, zero hour match calling their name. Possibly. For the double. Either zero hour or buy in. Whatever they end up 
uh, calling it for... Because let, let's just be honest, that's, that's basically where that match is going to be for Double or yeah. Nothing. I, I don't know what it is about Anna J.A.S., man. She's got a fat ass and a bad attitude. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. The, the Black Bull Comic Club are in the back. Um, they're gonna about to, you know, Chris Frantano's is like, I, I'm ready to do this. And then John Moxley's like, like, you know like, what? Hey, no, no, no he's, he's, cool. he's cool. And then and then turns around and starts beating the living well, crap out of... Is, I think uh, Christopher Daniels said, like, oh, man, I... I I knew you would change, or, like, I knew, you know, it's good to see uh, that you changed, John. No, it's good to see that you still are a man of honor. That's what he said. Oh, okay, and then, and then you know, Chris, and then, John, and then John Moxley, Moxley is like, yeah, fuck this. He, like, John Moxley basically had that look and that, like, internal thought of, like, yeah, fuck this guy. Beat him down. And then they showed, and then he's like, oh, we don't even, we, we've never changed, not even for the OGs. Uh, Not even thoughts for the on vets. yeah, thoughts on that one. They they are just on a rampage. They are just gonna beat down. Yeah, no pun intended. Um, yeah, <laughs> they're they're just gonna beat down literally anybody, and that's why this this episode's name is gonna be Black Bull. Um, no one can trust a Black Bull Combat Club. Nobody, even yeah. even guys like Christopher Daniels. Um, literally nobody. I mean, Christopher Daniels. They're all gonna call them amateurs in the end of the day. It's just, nobody can be, nobody can trust the Blackpool Combat Club. They are, they are the heel faction for a reason, and they're just gonna keep on beating the living crap out of everybody and anybody in their way. Um, so we're gonna get on to our next match here as uh, FTR, Jeff Jarrett, and Jay Lethal face off against the Varsity Athletes and Slim J. Slim J is part of the Varsity Athletes. Oh, okay. Uh. Yeah, FTR is the fair and Jay Lethal facing off against the, the varsity athletes. Um, not really um, much, you know, action that happened in this match itself, other than um, Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett tagging themselves in from FTR and getting the majority of the action in this match. Um, there was a time that Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett were trying to showboat, and then FTR were right behind them. Oh, yeah, were, when they did the... Uh... As they were trying to the, the fight with, you know, each other there. Um, well, I mean, FTR did the strut, the, the Jeff Jarrett strut right behind uh, Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal. So, but ultimately, and then they, they caught him. They're like, "What are you two doing? Get out of the ring! This isn't your time." And ultimately, yeah, they they, they win and beat the first of the athletes. And then uh, tension seemed to be brewing after the match. And then Mark Briscoe had to step in and stop it. Yeah, there because there's ultimately a custody battle of as Mark, of much Mark Briscoe. as I don't want to see. The FTR going have to face off against Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal. It kind of makes sense. For everything that's going on with with everything with Mark Briscoe and what's going on with that, so I I think we're truly gonna see FTR putting those tag team titles on the line against Jay, Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal. I mean, didn't we at one point have the acclaimed versus uh, Jarrett and Lethal? For we did, the... but it just seems like I'm that's glad worth... it never came to anything, and that we didn't see. Jarrett and Lethal as the tag team champions. But it just seems but... like that's what's going to happen in the, in the sense is that, like, yeah. Mark Briscoe, you know, I think he's going to get involved in some way. He might help FTR retain the tag team titles against mm-hmm. them. Who knows? But it, it just seems like, yeah, that that's what they're leading towards is FTR and Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal for the, the AEW World Tag Team titles. And uh, I guess that's all right. Because you got to do something with the tag team titles in that sense. And um, you, you see Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal almost on, you know, Rampage like almost every single week at this point. So you might as well have them be the first opponents for the tag team titles for FTR. Um, yeah, so later tonight we're going to get a international championship match between Orange Cassidy and Bandito. Yeah. Uh, thoughts on that one? Can huh. Bandito be the one in 1901? Uh, for I doubt it, but I mean, I don't. Ex- I I 
definitely expected it's going to be a great back and forth match between those two. And side note for Bandito, he is a former ROH World World Heavyweight Champion. Yes, he is too. So, um, what better way to the giving Orange Cassidy a challenge? I mean, ultimately, maybe you're not going to dethrone Orange Cassidy, but but we never know. We never know. Bandito could be the one that could dethrone Orange Cassidy here, as these two men have. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm not faced off against each other before. So I think this is the first time ever match between both these men. So honestly, what what better way to have... But then again, I mean, if Orange Cassidy doesn't drop the title, and it makes me wonder, like, when is he going to drop the title? And who is it going to be yeah, that he drops the title against? Um, I mean, so far in this run, with as the uh, international slash... All Atlantic champion Orange Cassidy has defended it against the likes of the current pure champion in Ring of Honor, Katsuyori Shibata. He's defended it against um, who else? I think Kip Sapien and, and other guys like that. He even, yes, he did. He even it defended Kip, it that's right. in Japan too. Yep. I mean, he he's he's well, defended it. actually. I don't know that he's defended in Japan. I don't think he has. But... Well, there was footage of him defending it against somebody. I think it was in Japan. I don't know. But um, it was some indie show somewhere. Did he defend it I think it you're talking about the show for New Japan in Philly where he faced Gabriel Kidd. I think so, yeah. But... Because that was at Collision... That was NJPW Collision in Philadelphia. But all, 2300 or right now. but ultimately orange cassidy uh, he could retain but who knows um but there was um a certain you know man that that did as el hijo del vikingo oh and realistico this two men. man there i can't say enough good things about him man like i like i oh my God, i just want to know i just want to know how long it's going to be until he's He's signed under all the wrestling. Uh, I mean, probably once he loses the mega championship. Because this man has been shown on ROH, has sh- yep. been shown on AEW multiple yep. different times. I mean, he is just a great sensation. Well, not to mention... Um, I'm honestly happy that more of these luchadors are yes. getting signed under AEW because... You need more luchadors. You really do. You need you, you need more variety you in do. AEW. I mean, because you've already signed Bandito. You've already signed Commander. You have the Lucha Brothers. Um, you know. You have Roosh. Even though, I mean, he doesn't I show a lot really of luchador. A luchador. Um, Drillistico. Mm-hmm. So, well, that's an interesting one, though, because I don't really know if he's like signed Drillistico. But at the same time I wouldn't be surprised because I'm pretty why sure else he would is. he be there? Exactly. I'm um, pretty sure he is. But yeah, Drillistico was trying as much as he could luchadors. to be able to beat El Hijo del Vikingo, but no El Hijo del Vikingo is just too much to handle. He's a, there's a reason why he's held that title for yeah. over five hundred days. I kind of think he he's uh, in the running to hold that mega championship for like two years, and quite frankly, I think he's uh, but he's slated to hold it much longer than Kenny Omega did. But then after the match gets beaten down by the other members of um, LFI, uh, but I mean. He, he... If that's the case, I mean, it'd be interesting if it's going to be um, yeah, Vance or if it's going to be Roosh that's going to try to compete for the AAA oh, Mega Preston Championship. Vance, yeah. Yes, Preston Vance or um, El Hijo. Now, or... that's the thing. We, uh, we didn't have this written down and we, you know, no, n- weren't going to talk about, like, but the one thing that I wanted to talk about with Ring of Honor this past week is the fact that Vikingo defended his uh, AAA Mega Championship on not just Dynamite, 
but also, or I'm I'm sorry, uh, on Rampage, but also on Ring of Honor against Gringo Loco. So, yeah, Vikingo has been busy with defending that mega championship. That's what I'm saying. Like, how long is it going to be until he's, you know, signed under All Elite? Because I would assume that, you know, that's going to be coming soon. You know, Tony Khan likes the kid, and yeah. he's... he sees a lot of potential in him. And, I mean, and, you know, how could sure you not? He's not lost a match ever since, you know, competing on all the or ROH. I think you know, you're I, right, actually. So, honestly, I mean, that would be... I think That'd he be would be... a hell of a signing for AEW. I, I think so, too. Just the way that he maneuvers in the ring, and it's only at 25 years old. Yeah. I mean, he can be that, he's you know... Got the whole, he's got his whole future ahead of him. Exactly. So, honestly, everyone is going to conclude this episode of No Final Bell. Please make sure to follow us at social media at Tinkle Sports. Um, you want to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the bell notification for for more on our YouTube channel at Tinkle Sports Entertainment. Um, we are also usually on Facebook Watch as well. If you don't want to watch us on YouTube, um Make sure to probably you know follow us on Facebook so yeah. you can watch it on there as well, if you, you know as well as uh, YouTube, and also we have other shows as well on Tinkle Sports Entertainment over there as we have Sunday morning Tinkle every Sunday at nine and we have Out of Turn Four uh, every Tuesday at five unless uh, Brian announces that there will be a cancellation of the show, but other than that everyone we're gonna conclude this episode. Mm-hmm. We'll catch you in the next video. Uh, Goodbye, everyone.